When one reads the pages of the New Testament and relates what he reads to the contemporary church, he's compelled to conclude that the relationship is more frequently one of contrast rather than one of comparison. But why? Why the tremendous disparity between the church of the 90s and the church of the 1990s? We're related to the same person. We have available the same power. And we are called essentially to the same purpose. But that's where we've been derailed. You see, the early church never became fogged as to their purpose. They knew why they were here instead of in heaven. Do you? You can't make proper use of anything until you know what it's made for. I hold in my hand a felt-tip pen, ideal for the purpose for which it was made. But if I should decide to use that as a screwdriver, not only would it not accomplish my objective, but if I should use it in that way, it would ruin the pen for the purpose for which it is made. It seems to me that it is long overdue that we return to the biblical blueprints to discover why we are here instead of in heaven. And I think the Lord gives us a very important clue in Matthew chapter 5. So let me ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to focus our attention on verses 13 through 16. But as we have learned in interpretation, we've got to place it into the context. This is a part of what is called the Sermon on the Mount, the Manifesto of the King. It's a description of what our Lord wanted His disciples to be and to do. So what we need to understand is that verses 13 through 16, which contain two metaphors, are preceded by the eight Beatitudes. And there is a cause-effect relationship between the two. You see, Jesus is teaching us that your attitudes determine your actions. That being is much more important than doing. And that character comes before conduct. God is into character, not credential. And what he's teaching us in this section is... If you want to make a difference, you are going to have to be different. Now, in verses 13 through 16, let's look at the two metaphors. What are they? You are salt, salt and, light. and you are light. 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 You are salt to penetrate. You are light to illuminate. Now let's take just a few moments to make a couple observations. What did you discover as you studied this passage of Scripture? What are some things that come to your attention? I notice it addresses us that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light of the world. And what's very important about that, Stefan, is that it's emphatic. See, the Greeks were great communicators. And when they wanted to emphasize a word, they would take it out of its normal word order, bring it right up to the front of the sentence, and that was like taking a red pencil and underscoring it. So that this ought to be translated, in light of Stefan's insight, you are the salt of the earth. You, with all of your hang-ups. You, with all of your personality. You, with all of your giftedness. You, with all of your problems. You are the salt of the earth. And the same is true with the second expression. You are the light of the world. What else did you discover? It's possible. it's possible for both salt and light to be ineffective in relation to their basic purposes. All right. It's possible for them to be ineffective in their ba basic purposes. Both are absolutely essentials to life. But 
they can be prostituted because they are not used for the purpose for which they were designed. What else did you discover? That we're constantly in the light of others. Uh, as it talks about being on a, a city on the hill, once we come to the, to the knowing of Christ and profess that faith, we're constantly going to be watched and seen in everything right. that we do. You are not to be hidden. That's with design. Now let's just work our way briefly through that. In verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he asks a question, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And he answers his own question by saying, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, if you have a pencil or a pen, I want you to underline the little word men because it is key to the interpretation of the passage. You see, he's not talking in this paragraph about salvation. He's talking about testimony. And every man and woman listening to my voice is an authority on that subject. Did you ever try to share your faith with someone? And in the process, they said, hold it. Uh, do you know so-and-so? Oh, yes, I know them quite well. Uh, do they claim to be a Christian? Well, yes, they do. Then I'm not interested. Now, would you mind if we change the subject? When I was working in the NFL with the Cowboys, I discovered early on that if you are going to give a testimony in the NFL, you better be prepared to back it up with your life or they're going to cram it right down the center of your throat. And Jesus picks up that very expressive figure and says, you are the salt of the earth. But if you lose your saltiness, then you lose your purpose for existence. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think Jesus used the figure of salt. Can you give me any reasons? What are some possibilities? Salt is a preservative. Salt is a preservative. Very important. And particularly to see it in the cultural setting. Mm -hmm. See, they had no refrigeration, no rapid means of transportation. The bulk of the fish were caught up in the Galilee. The major market was down in Jerusalem. How do you get them from the north to the south? You salt them down. And that preserves from corruption. Now, we're talking about application, and we can come back to these, but just hold on to that for a minute. Ask yourself the question, what am I doing with respect to my society? Am I helping to push them over the cliff, or am I helping to preserve the corruption taking place in the society? What other reason do you think? Taste. Taste. Salt improves the taste. Do you ever eat mashed potatoes without some salt? Blah. But the interesting thing is if you get too much salt, then you've ruined the potatoes. You see, salt is most effective when you can't recognize it, but just its effects. Interesting in terms of applying that to our lives as Christians. What else does salt do? Salt can also be an irritant when it's used incorrectly. Can be an irritant if used incorrectly. But of course, no Christians <laughs> are irritants. <laughs> it creates thirst. It creates mm. thirst. I dare you to eat one pretzel. <laughs> one peanut. See, the moment you eat one, you're hooked. Because it creates that tremendous thirst. Interesting to ask. You making anybody thirsty? For Jesus Christ? Anybody ask you recently for an explanation? You know, what makes you tick? Why are you so different? Now, the interesting thing is, he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. We said you are a salt to penetrate. You are light to illuminate. And he gives two illustrations. First, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Most cities in the Near East were built on hills. Not only because they had no air conditioning, it was cooler there, but primarily for military purposes. But you can't hide those cities. There's no curtain you can pull down. And then he says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and he gives light to everyone in the house. You women are incredibly gifted in your ability in interior design. Gene and I travel around the country and often get into a home beautifully decorated. 
completely coordinated colors, so warm and friendly, you immediately think, man, I've lived here all my life. But you know, I've never gone into a home where they just put down new wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in the living room and found this huge hump in the center of the living room. I said, what's that? The lady said, that's my new lamp. <laughs> my friend, you don't put a lamp under the rug. You put it on a stand so that it illuminates the page that a person is reading. And Jesus says, the same thing is true about you. In fact, he says, in the same way. Notice he's using an analogy. Let your light shine before whom? Men. Men. There it is again. That they may see your good deeds and praise you? Uh-uh. Your Father, which is in heaven. See, Jesus is saying, you are to make a difference in your society by being different. You're going to provide an alternative to your generation concerning what Jesus Christ can do in human experience. There's another option. Now, I want to ask you a question that I think really brings this passage alive. We've done a lot of observing and a reasonable amount of interpretation, though to be sure there is a lot more in this rated portion of God's Word. But let me ask you this question. How does this passage apply to you? I want you to think in terms of your own life and see if you can give some good illustrations of how you would apply this passage. I'm saw. I'm light, living in contemporary society. This, What's one way? This verse, particularly down toward the bottom, talks about your good works. Good immediately works. immediately thinks, makes me think of the work that I do. I have my own business, so I set the policies. And those policies determine how people are going to react to the, to the world, or to the business world anyway. And uh, they also look, they know I'm a Christian, so they look at those policies and they look at my actions and they're constantly judging, which makes it very tough. So what they're really looking at, Vince, is not just what you say, but what you do. Exactly. Are those two congruent or are they contrasted? And isn't it fabulous that we put our finger right at the outset on the business life? Because that's the one place where oftentimes Christianity is missing in the marketplace. I love a quotation from Oz Guinness, an astute observer of the American scene, he puts his finger on it when he says, the main problem with American Christians is not that they aren't where they should be, but they are not what they should be, right where they are as doctors, businessmen, teachers, etc. Beautiful point. What else do you discover that I, relates to your life? I have found... Uh just a verse that really has been helpful for me in raising children in Deuteronomy 6 where God says that you have to first keep his commandments in your own heart and then teach them to your children and unless we as parents become uh, we cannot be effective in our children's lives unless we really are salt to them and infiltrate into their lives but the key there is that it first has to grip our own hearts you can't impart what you do not possess you know the thing Lucy, that used to bother me so much about my children is that they reminded me so much of myself. You know, why are you like that, son? Because you're my father. <laughs> but you see, if I don't possess it, if it hasn't gripped me to change my life, it, it's real hard to communicate to them. So it not only affects our business life, it affects our home life. What other areas? Well, you know, what Lucy said, it also says it, it gives light to all that are in the house and the first thing I thought of was my own house and my own family. So, If it doesn't work in your home, it doesn't work. Right. Don't export it. All right. Any other comments? For me, I have very little contact with non-Christians. I work in a Christian organization. I'm involved in church. My friends are Christians. And so I know I really need to make the effort to get out of my Christian microcosm so I can affect the world. Profound insight, Sherry. You've got to take the initiative to build bridges with an unsaved world. One of the things that occurs to me is that Jesus was always interested in individuals, and something I'm really working on personally is as I go about 
as a woman at home interfacing with people in the community is to try to get to know their name and to get to know them as an individual just to be able to relate to them as an individual and most people wear a name tag and so you can call them by their name as you're checking out or getting to know them and I feel like that begins to build a bridge of personal interest which is different than what we see mostly in our busy world. Wasn't it Lucy who said in the cartoon, I love humanity, it's people I can't understand. Mm. <laughs> but what you do is to build a bridge. I'm interested in you, therefore, a good possibility you might be interested in my Savior. In my experience, Dr. Henry, before I came to know the Lord, I used to like to dance and happy hours and party, partying. But when I accept the Lord as my personal Savior, I changed. I didn't do those things anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the word of God, I'm the salt and light. And my friends could see the difference mm -hmm. when they said, let's go to happy hours. I couldn't go anymore. But the Lord gradually changed my life. And I didn't just change overnight. It was a process. I really? saw the importance of staying in the church where I still maybe had a beer or something like that. I stayed in the church. And as I began to hide the word of God in my heart, I began to change and that things that I used to do just disappeared and my friends could see the difference in my lifestyle. That's a profound testimony when mm -hmm. people see the difference. Yeah. In the environment of the inner city uh, where I do a lot of work, um, it is important among all of the darkness that is there in terms of crime and, and uh, the broken families to be a visible alternative. Mm -hmm. And I think the Christian life mm -hmm. brings that kind of perspective into that darkness there. It is an illumination of an alternative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. And how desperately needed it is in that kind of an environment where people easily become lacking in hope. My right? wife and I have talked about the application of that last phrase and glorify your Father who is in heaven because of the works and not ourselves. We've talked about if we left our neighborhood... Would people remember us just as being good neighbors and kind to the other children on the mm -hmm. block? Or would they remember us as followers of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. And that's been convicting mm -hmm. to us as we've thought about that, so that it's, it's our works and also using opportunities to speak up for Jesus Christ as they present themselves. Beautiful question. What will they remember me mm -hmm. for? Mm -hmm. By the way, in many cases, not what you would like to think. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? I think just the... The verses remind me because Christ chose the words, of the examples of salt and light, that it's those things are so common, they're so frequent, they're with us all the time, and I think it speaks to me that, you know, I've got to be constantly applying the principles of my Christian walk in everything I do, and that's where it's a challenge. It's a challenge sometimes to be positive in taking out the, the trash or, or positive when you get irritated traveling or, or the, the really the mundane things. It's easy for us to be spiritual in some of the places, mm -hmm. in the visual places, but it's in the places sometimes hidden that, the, that we have to carry that out. Mm -hmm. Most of us are better, Bill, at the biggies, but the little things, mm -hmm. you know, we fade in the stretch. And yet oftentimes it's the little things that really communicate the reality of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in our life. Carol? I agree with Bill on the fact of it being a challenge. I teach kindergarten at a Christian school, which would make you think that that would be easier to follow this because you get to teach the principles. And mm. part of the context, the blessed are the gentle. And, and I was thinking about, well, that's easy. I get to tell the children um, that Jesus told them to be gentle, and you tell them how to be gentle with one another. But you realize that the key is for the teacher to be gentle to the mm. children so that they can see the pattern. They have something to follow. Well, I do it like the teacher does it to me. Mm. That's how I do it to my neighbor. Mm. You know, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said something I've never recovered from. He said, I am come that you might have life. I mean, really live. Did you ever ask yourself, am I living or just existing? Or as someone suggested, am I providing an alternative lifestyle? Sheldon Van Auken, in his excellent book, Severe Mercy, has a piece that says, the best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness. But the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians. When they're self-righteous and smug 
in complacent consecration, when they're narrow and repressive, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. The great message of Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 16, is that God left you on earth in order that you might penetrate the society, not run from it. That you might illuminate it, not hide out in some Christian ghetto. You're here to make a difference, a permanent difference in your life and therefore, as we've seen, in the life of others. God's method is always to take a clean person, drop them in the midst of a corrupt society to demonstrate the power of His grace.